So we're about to look at a very large chart that will take us from the earliest choices you can make. And, and the uh, earliest choices you can make in, in worldview thinking to get to a specific end result view regarding God, regarding life, in relation to some, some view of God. You have three primary choices, and that's all you have. When, when one is kind of in hindsight looking backward to see and reevaluate their worldview, they have to look and see which path have I gone down, whether by birth or being born in a culture. What is my worldview? What is my religion today? But where does it come from? And what, what are the ideal choices if I could go back in time and pick which route seems, seems now in hindsight to be the best route? And you only have three choices. So we're talking about major worldview isms. The, the, the big choices in life, looking, looking in hindsight and seeing ideally what is the best choice to make to come at the best end result in terms of worldview or, or religion or philosophy. So major worldview choices and isms. So really, the beginning of this process is quite simple. Regarding a God concept, what are the cho choices? You could say, there's no God. Or you could say, there is God, that's simple. No God, or there is God. And if there is a God, then the question is, how many? One God, many gods are the choices. So really, you only have three options here. No God, God meaning one, or many gods. Now what would be the next step in, in our thinking to look in hindsight and ideally come to a conclusion? Wouldn't it be to define, if we believe in God or gods, what is that God? Or who are, who are those gods? What's the definition of God or gods? And that's why I say there are, there are various basic isms that one has to decide about. And there are seven or eight, I, I'm going to give you eight major isms that are part of the choices that come under these three uh, original starting points. Now if you choose no God, then what is the ism that comes out of the view of no God? Obviously it's atheism. A means no, so no God, atheism. And the other options are, if you choose God, that's theism. If you choose many gods, what is the word for many? To be fancy, using fancier language, we use the word poly. So polytheism. Those are only three isms. There are basically eight major isms. Now, shortly after I give you a, a brief uh, review of the major isms, such as eight major isms, we're going to go back and put this all together into kind of a uh, an overall chart showing how we can go from one God to Christian theism, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Trinitarian monotheism, and see how we can go down the chart and find, find a specific view such as ours as biblical Christians who follow uh, Trinitarian theism. But for now, let's identify the eight major isms that are part. We have three here that come out of these roots. But interestingly enough, if you take this path, which we'll explore shortly, you find out that this leads sooner or later to other isms. If you go to the part of the world that is known as India, which has Hinduism, Hinduism is a number of isms under the umbrella of Hinduisms, Hinduism. And under that large umbrella, you find 
a variety such as this. Uh, most Americans would think that under theism, you have one option called pantheism. And people often think incorrectly that Hinduism is only pantheism. It's not. But that's one of the, one of the versions of Hinduism. Another option of pantheism is a word that's much like this word. It's called panentheism. Now, what does pan mean? P-A-N in, in this category, not in kitchen cookware, but what does it mean in this regard? It means all. All of God, or God is all. God is all things. So, let's demonstrate this by a little circle here. If we say all is God, and this circle represents God, so here's the, the symbol for God, the circle. If pantheism is true, then all things, these dashed lines will represent trees and chairs and planets and people and animals. These, uh, I'm sorry, these, uh, these uh, plain lines, not dashed, but plain lines, will represent all things. So if this view is true, then all things are God, God is all things. There's, there's no distinction. Everything is all blurred together, so chairs and tables and drinking cups and shirts, everything is God. All is God, God is all. These are all manifestations of God. So Hinduism says we must realize who we really are, what this cup really is. We call these things cups and stools. <coughs> what they really are are manifestations of the oneness of all things. This, this is known as monism also. All things are one, and that one thing is God. Now, this over here, panentheism, by an accident of vocabulary in English, the E-N is really much like the, the meaning of the word I-N. So this, this would mean all is in God, is the view here. So it's a little bit different than all is God. Now we're saying all is in God. So maybe we draw our, our lines this way. Here, our lines do not touch the circle. So there's a distinction. But God has as his content all things. So if, if, I, if I am God in my body, then maybe you would say that the skin is God, but the inside, the organs, would be not God, but they're in me, and in a way they affect me, and I, can, I affect them. So panentheism is almost like there is a, a slight connection, like maybe a chain that connects the inside part that's not God to the outside part that is God. So that when the inside moves, like, like if, our, if our organ, my, my stomach or kidneys, move inside my flesh, <clears throat> Though I am not my kidneys or organs, but when my organs move, then they make my skin move. I might have a bulge in my skin, the outer surface. So if this, if this is like uh, a planet, like planet Earth has a ship in its orbit, then it would, perhaps if it moves this way, it would ca cause God to bulge that way. So panentheism is where we have an effect upon God, or, vice versa, God can have an effect upon us. If God pushes this way against the things in him, it, it moves us. So we, we can affect God, God can affect us. We can manipulate God, God can manipulate us. So this is either very similar, yet they're distinct enough to make them a different ism. Polytheism would be a number of circles. So each circle would be a different God. Now what often happens in polytheism, this is not in our notes at this point, but what often happens is when you have a number of gods, inevitably people have in their mind that one God is the chief among them, a, a, a supreme God among other gods. This is called as kind of a minor or a subpoint theism, henotheism. H-E-N-O in theism, henotheism. That's the idea that, yes, there are many gods, but because 
Just like when there are a husband and wife, when you have a conflict, you have one person who, who finally makes the decision. So here you have a supreme God among other gods. We call that henotheism, but it's still part of polytheism, many gods. Of course, atheism, there, there is no God, so there's no circle to draw to illustrate that. Now, also, as, a, as an option of atheism, is what's known as finite theism. That's one option that comes out of theism. You may think, well, okay, I'm going to follow the path from theism and see where it leads me. And, and some people have come to the conclusion that God is limited in many ways, such as we are as finite beings. So they, they look upon God as being finite. This, this would be much like the Mormon view of God. In Mormonism, God is literally flesh and bones, just stronger and smarter than we are. So the Mormon God would be a classic illustration of finite theism. Very precise, very specific, but really just a larger version of what, what we are as humans. Another version of theism would be deism. We had a handout on deism earlier. You may recall what this is then. God will be separate from the world. Here's the world. There's God. God made the world a long time ago, and then God decided to leave the world to work on its own with the principles and laws and orders he set up. So God gave us gravity, he gave us mind, he gave us conscience. And so even though God exists and he created us, he is detached from us now since creation, and he wants us to work out our own problems. And so we are tempted then to call upon God only when we get in trouble, but yet we're still left to our own devices. God wants us to work things out the best we can. So when things happen like the Holocaust, well, that's our problem, we've got to clean it up. God's not there to come to our rescue. So that's, that's, this is called deism. The belief in God that he does not have much involvement in, my, in our lives or in our world. There's a separation between God and the world, and we're left on our own with the principles he set up. Now, in your handout, as you'll see, uh, when we go through this uh, chart in a more systematic fashion shortly, you'll see a wavy line here, which means this is generic theism. Because as we're, as we're seeing here, there are many split-offs that fall under the general, general category of theism, but this is very ill-defined. But I'm using a chart developed mostly by Norman Geisler, and Geisler um, distinguishes an, uh, a more specific kind of theism that we're going to end up with in a, in a, when we look at the chart shortly. And this final product is called also theism, but to distinguish it from our starting point, which is more generic and, and unknown as a blobby start, starting point, here is a specific theism without that wavy line, because this theism is also uh, the option that we choose as Christians. And this theism then has under it the view that we have as Trinitarian theists. Here's one example of, of theism that's very, very specific. Trinitarian theism. So in this sense, uh, God is distinct from the world, but I have an arrow that penetrates the world, unlike this one, here, God has entered our world various times. Of course, he's omnipresent. You know, actually, we should make this circle different to be more biblical. Uh, God is omnipresent. So, he is not the world. He's distinct from it, but he is everywhere, and he also interacts with us, especially in his incarnation. The God, of Son, uh, God the Son became human in the incarnation and, of course, has become one of us. So this is the, the, the final uh, direction that we would maintain as, as biblical Christians. But these are the, the basic isms. I believe we have eight here. One, two, three, 
four the generic generic theism five six seven eight so even the, the basic uh, isms the eight isms that we have to deal with in our thinking if we're going to be, be a systematic thinker regarding the various options we're going to come back then and look at uh, this starting point again and follow a systematic path and see all the choices that are before us before we come to our conclusion that theism that's specific versus the generic one that's ill defined and Trinitarian theism in particular is the most sensible and credible and evidential option that we should have as a worldview. But also realize there are many other worldviews, and these are, are, are some of the conclusions they've come to, however incorrectly, that we should know about and deal with them as, as world, worldwide Christians. So thank you. We'll come back and develop this point shortly.